Well, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Carl Jackson. Um, I've been a member of this church for a very, very long time now. Um, God has blessed us richly um, with a very nice property and a nice sanctuary. Um, we feel very honored to have everyone that can be here tonight. Um, this is the first 2015 Biblical Worldview Conference. We have had creation seminars over the past about five years, and we've invited guest speakers in for about five years now, and they've been very well attended, and we thought we'd try something new with Pastor Thompson here. Um, he came down from Minnesota, and while he was up in Minnesota and Wisconsin, he had had some worldview seminars up there, and he said, well, let's, let's try it down here in San Antonio. So. This is our first attempt at it, and hopefully it'll go very well. We really are very honored to have some very good, very distinguished speakers with us uh, for this conference. Um, I would like to tell everybody there will be a question and answer period um, Saturday, and then after each presentation. And we will put a microphone up, try to keep questions brief. That'll keep things going. We do have some, um, for anyone that comes tomorrow, um, we will have restaurant available for lunch and then there will be dinner tomorrow evening. I would like to start off by introducing you to the concept of worldview. The concept of worldview is closely related to the term philosophy and religion. It is set of presuppositions or assumptions to which one holds. A worldview can be compared to a pair of glasses. When putting on different lenses of different strengths, one gets a different view of the world each time. The worldview a person puts on gives him a certain perspective. It is how one looks at life and the world. It, help, it helps determine how we think, what we believe, what we see about, what we think about nature, even what we value to some extent, how we view issues like the supernatural, whether or not truth can be known, who Jesus of Nazareth is or was, where truth comes from, what the nature of man is like. In short, a worldview helps determine how one sees every aspect of life. Thus, there is a biblical, or what we would call a confessional Lutheran worldview. Putting on biblical glasses and keeping them on would truly give an objective view and a truthful view of life. I would like to introduce Pastor Thompson. Test. Thank you. Uh, again, on behalf of the congregation, uh, I also welcome you to this Biblical Worldview Conference, which I think you will find very interesting and fascinating, and uh, hopefully um, you'll be able to uh, jot down a number of questions, too, and we'll have time to answer those. As, as Carl mentioned, we'll have a Q&A period after each of the presentations for about 15 minutes, maybe a little bit more. But then also uh, tomorrow evening, as you mentioned, uh, from starting at 7.30 after our great uh, Texas cookout, we're going to have a uh, table talk in which we'll have a lot of time for questions and answers with all the presenters. Tonight we have, uh, all, uh, we have four of the presenters here, myself and Pastor Weber and uh, Chris Rosebro and uh, Daniel Van Boris. Um, uh, Joel Heck will be here tomorrow. He's actually presenting tonight, I believe, and also tomorrow morning, so, uh, but not here. But we welcome you. And I'm here mainly right now to introduce our first uh, presenter, uh, Pastor Jay Weber. Uh, as Carl mentioned, uh, we used to hold these worldview conferences up in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota. And uh, we began those um, in 2005. And, uh, and I was in charge of putting them together. And I decided what we need, first of all, for our worldview seminar up there was somebody simply to present the biblical or Christian worldview. And I, right away, thought of uh, Pastor Weber. And uh, that's because I not only know him, and he's not my good friend, but also he's perhaps one of the most theologically astute theologians in the whole country, in my opinion. 
and so it's a real privilege to have him here. Uh, Pastor Weber and his wife Carol, they have three children and two grandchildren now, correct? And uh, his son is also a pastor. Uh, pastor Weber uh, graduated from uh, the Fort Wayne Seminary in 1988, which uh, if you're Lutheran, you uh, know that that's a Missouri Synod uh, facility seminary. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, Pastor Weber that same year, 1988, I think it was, came over to our our little Evangelical Lutheran Synod. And so we were uh, truly blessed to have him here. And, and he and I have been, uh, like I said, good friends ever since. The reason we have his topic first is because it's very important to lay the groundwork. You really can't understand what is false unless you first understand what is true. And so what he's going to be doing this evening is putting up before you in a very easy to understand fashion, as long as you stay awake, uh, the Christian and biblical worldview. So please help me in welcoming Pastor Weber. Okay, if you, if you don't, you can ask one of the members here and they'll, they'll get you what you need. Studies have been made recently which have demonstrated that between people in America who profess to be Christians and people who do not profess to be Christians, there is almost no difference in how they answer questions about morality and ethics. In other words, people who profess to be Christians do not have a worldview that is based on their Christian profession, but they are still enmeshed in the worldview of the unbelievers who surround them. The Bible does not only give us information about how to have an interior, personal, spiritual connection with God. The Bible also tells us how to look at everything in our human experience, how to understand it, and how to make sense out of it. There is no aspect of our Christian theology that does not touch on all of the things that might happen to us, all the things we might see, all the things we might think about in this world. Our Christian faith informs every single experience we ever have within our families, within our larger society, within the world. Because the Christian religion, as revealed in Scripture, gives us God's perspective on what is really going on in human history and what is really going on in the lives of human beings today. The presentation that I will make this evening is a reflection, more or less, of how I do things as a congregational pastor. We like to do Bible studies, and so we're going to do a Bible study because the topic assigned was the biblical and Christian worldview, I want to use as the starting point for the things that I say what Holy Scripture says. And then we will expand from that in discussion and elaboration. And so I will draw your attention first to section A and the somewhat lengthy passage from St. Paul's epistle to the Romans that appears there. The natural knowledge of God and human moral corruption. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That is St. Paul's starting point. The wrath of a holy God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Not because they don't know the truth but because deep down they do know it and they suppress it. So keep that in mind as he then elaborates in his description of the fundamental human condition, which was true not only in the first century when he wrote this, but which is just as true today. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world 
in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. This is St. Paul's summary statement of what we would call the natural knowledge of God. Human beings are different from other creatures because all human beings by nature actually do already know that there is a God. There is still, we might say, a faint remnant, at least externally, of the fact that human beings were created in the image of God. And so there is an intuition, there is a sense that there is a greater power in the universe. And there is also a sense of what this greater power expects of us. This is something that everybody actually knows. And even people who deny the existence of God usually do so on the basis of what we would describe as the natural knowledge of God. In other words, many atheists will say that the reason why they are atheists is because there's so much injustice in the world. The question to ask would be, how do you know that there is injustice in the world? Are you saying that there is a moral standard that exists above and beyond all of us by which we can measure and evaluate the things that are going on to determine if they're just or unjust. And of course the assumption is that there is such a standard because otherwise there's no way to determine the difference between something being just and something being unjust. And so it is actually the natural knowledge of God and the knowledge of God's righteousness that is the criteria by which atheists claim that there is no God. Believe me, I lived in the former Soviet Union for eight years, a place where Joseph Stalin, who was a real genuine atheist, was in power for several decades. And if you want to know what a real atheist who has completely tuned out the natural knowledge of God is like, it was Joseph Stalin. He killed millions of his people because they got in the way of his goals because they got in the way of his quest for ever greater power in the Soviet Union. He had no moral compunction at all against killing people. No sense at all that he was doing something wrong. And he presided over an entire apparatus of the Soviet Union which was willing to do these things and carry out these desperate acts. That's what real atheism is like. People who think that there is no God because there's injustice are showing that they're not actually atheists. It's just that they don't understand where this intuition is coming from to show them that there is such a thing as injustice and that they shouldn't like it. All people are born with this knowledge. And this is also something that the Christian church is aware of as it takes the gospel to all nations. There is something in every human being that can connect to the message about what God has provided for all people in Jesus Christ because they know that there is a God. They just don't know what he's really like or what he has done for them in his son. St. Paul continues, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them up in, their, in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Here Paul now talks about the other fundamental reality of human life. Not only that humans are intuitively aware that there is a God and that there is some sense in which God is providing standards of justice or injustice, right or wrong, but there's also this deep pollution and corruption in all people which causes them to be hostile to the God who in their reason they know exists. There is this irrational opposition to God's order, to God's standards. What Paul describes here is the way in which the old-fashioned flagrant idolatry of the ancient nations emerged, 
where people began to worship images and other kinds of deities that they could control and master rather than worshiping the true God who created them. They began to fabricate in their own minds and worship manageable gods and gods that would not be a threat to them. And of course, he also talks about how this kind of idolatry led to perversion and moral corruption in other aspects of people's lives. And he especially goes on to discuss that in the next paragraph. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is a description of the wholesale moral rebellion of human nature against God. So there is at the same time within everybody an innate intuitive understanding that there is a God and that this God is a God of power and a God with moral standards. But there is also inside everybody an irrational rebellion against this God, a self-defeating, self-destructive rebellion, which causes harm to ourselves, harm to our relationships. This is the paradox of human existence in this world. People know what's right, they do not do what's right, in fact, they actively do what's wrong. St. Paul quite evidently is talking about some sinful orientations and sinful behaviors and sinful attitudes that we can see all around us today. He talks about the lustfulness of homosexuality and lesbianism. He also talks about many of the other things that we see all around us. Murder, maliciousness, haters of God, insolent, inventors of evil. But notice some of the other things on this list which are in the same category. Disobedient to parents, foolish, gossips, slanderers. Are any of us unaffected by this corruption? No, we are not. It's only a matter of degree. Human nature is both aware of God and aware of his standards and also in an irrational state of rebellion against God. It's evident all around us and it's evident in us. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. There is, as I said, this inner rebellion within all people. But yet there is also, on the part of most people, the capacity to restrain that rebellion, at least as far as outward behavior is concerned. And so it is possible for people to establish societies. It is possible for people who are unbelievers to, to find ways to do uh, civil righteous act, civilly righteous acts in this world. There are people who are able to discipline themselves and govern their behavior in a way that would show that they're not just complete psychopaths, that they're not totally overcome and, over, and under the control of their inner sinful impulses. But yet even when people are able to find those kinds of external disciplines, on the inside there is still this rebellion. On the inside there is still this antagonism to the true God, even while also within human reason and the human conscience 
there is the knowledge that there is this God who is there and who someday will judge us. For so many people, they know deep down, subconsciously, that there will be an accounting. They know deep down that they are going to have to explain themselves. This is one of the reasons why people fear death, because they, they know that on the other side of death there is judgment. This is the very distressing and sad situation that human nature is in before human beings are approached by the gospel and before God does something marvelous and wonderful for people in the gospel. But for now, the point to be taken from this is our understanding of what is going on in the world and why it's going on. When you see people trying to be good, even if they're unbelievers, you can understand why. Because they have the natural knowledge of God. But when you see people doing irrational, self-destructive things, hurtful things, horrible things, you also know why that's happening. Because there is an inner, inborn corruption and rebellion against God that infects all people. Section B, science, civil order, and culture. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Man was created in the image of God and even though we have lost the substance of that image through sin so that that image now needs to be restored through Christ, there is still a faint echo of that image, or we might say that there is still the outward form of that image in all human beings. This is one of the reasons why human beings uniquely are curious and inquisitive. They want to understand the world. They want to know how it works. They want to grasp it, and they want to control it. Science arises from this innate human curiosity, this unique feature of human beings that causes us to want to explore and grasp the world in which we live. It is not inherent to science that scientists must believe in materialism or atheism. The vocation of a Christian scientist is actually the normal scientific vocation because a Christian scientist knows why he has this curiosity. He knows why it was built into him. And he knows who it is who has created the world that he is now trying to understand. God, who is a God of order, has created the world as an orderly, predictable thing. Indeed, among the ancients who believed that the various gods malevolently and capriciously would make their various things happen in the world of nature, in the realm of nature, were really not able to be scientists. You couldn't predict what would happen in the natural processes of the earth if you believed that there were various gods making things happen like storms and lightning bolts and all the things that many of the ancients thought the various gods were doing in the realm of nature. It was only when the Christian view of God and of creation came into various ancient societies that science as we know it today became possible. Because what the Christian worldview introduced was the expectation that there would be order in the world. That there would be predictability and testability. That there were certain natural laws that would help you to be able to decipher and decode what was going on around you and to help you to be able to understand it. To satisfy that innate human curiosity about the world in which we live. Righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. A servant who deals wisely has the king's favor, but his wrath falls on one who acts shamefully. Many of the passages of the Old Testament that speak of political affairs are speaking specifically of the ancient nation of Israel. 
And it is really not proper for us to directly apply those passages to the political societies in which we live today. But this particular passage from the book of Proverbs is not just talking about the nation of Israel. It is laying down a general principle that actually would apply to any society, to any people. Righteousness exalts a nation, that is, any nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. This is not talking so much about righteousness as, and sin insofar as it affects our relationship with God, but it is talking about righteousness and sin insofar as these things affect our relationships in a society. Right, civil righteousness builds up the orderliness and the cohesiveness and the moral character of a society. Civil sin disrupts this. Crime and criminal behavior and antisocial behavior destroy the fabric of a society's moral order. And there's a reference then to whether one has the king's favor or the king's wrath. The role of a political power, of a civil ruler, of a civil government in society is to reward those who are civilly righteous and to punish those who are civilly sinful, that is, criminal. And so we as Christians have a certain expectation for how governments will act in the promotion of righteousness and in the suppression of wickedness. And we also have an understanding that if people, at least in their outward behavior, behave respectfully and compassionately and justly toward one another, then the whole society will be better off. We will be able to have an opportunity for the emergence of culture fine arts, all kinds of beautiful things. But if you have moral chaos in a society, if there is no rule of law, if people don't care about the impact of their actions on others, then there will be only chaos. There will be anarchy. Human reason, even on the part of an unbeliever, is able to see that there is a benefit to living in a society that is orderly as compared to living in a state of complete anarchy and chaos. And we as Christians, of course, understand why this is so. Jesus is speaking now in the Gospel according to St. Matthew. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Remember what St. Paul taught us in the first reading, that there is on the part of people an awareness of the natural knowledge of God and an awareness of what is good and right, while there is also an inner evil. Jesus picks up on this same theme when he makes an interesting observation. People who are evil, who in their inner being are rebellious against God and sinful, still have the human capacity to love their children. This is an echo of the way people were originally created, and this is an echo of the natural knowledge of God. You don't have to be a Christian to love your spouse, to love your children, or to love your grandchildren. You just have to be a human being. And so we as Christians, even though we do believe in a doctrine of original sin, and even though we do believe that people in their hearts are alienated from God and spiritually separated from Him because of their sins by nature, we're also able to recognize that human beings still have the capacity for many decent things and for many virtuous things. People have the capacity to love their children, as Jesus points out specifically in this passage. And so, to the extent that we are members of a human society, which is comprised of both believers and unbelievers, we would recognize that. We would encourage the civil virtue of love and compassion and goodwill toward others, recognizing that at least externally in their societal relationships with each other, all human beings are capable of this and should be encouraged to live this way. Of course, the church has its own unique mission 
to preach the message of eternal salvation through Christ to people. But as Christians, we are also living in a civil society where it is not necessarily our calling on all occasions to preach to everybody. Nevertheless, we do have a calling to live with other people, to recognize that which is good, to celebrate that which is good, and to encourage that which is good. Things like fathers and mothers loving their children. And notice also in this passage, Jesus gives the golden rule. It has often been pointed out that the golden rule is not unique to the Christian faith, and that's true. Because the golden rule is simply based on reason, and it's based on the natural knowledge of God. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you would make sense to anybody who is being reasonable. When Jesus teaches it, therefore, he's teaching something that is not a unique principle of the Christian faith, but he's teaching something that coalesces and congeals what any reasonable thinking person should be able to recognize as true for the sake of living with other people in a family, in a community, in a nation. And so we as Christians recognize this. And we try to be a part of this in the society in which we live. Encouraging others likewise to be a contributing part of an orderly ethical society that is shaped by this understanding. St. Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. St. Paul here is giving a list of virtues and good things that we are to spend our time thinking about and contemplating. You know, we do live in a world that sometimes can be very discouraging, very depressing, and very sad. But yet, as Christians, and even as redeemed human beings, we recognize that there are also things in this world which are a reflection of the goodness of God, embedded in the world according to its status as that which God did make, and which therefore is still a reflection of his goodness, even with the corruption of sin. And so, we are able to live joyfully and fruitfully in this world, in spite of hardship, in spite of discouragement, by remembering St. Paul's words here, and by thinking about things that are honorable and just and pure and lovely and so forth. So many times people spend their mental energy thinking about the revenge they want to get on someone else, thinking about how angry they are at people who insulted them or offended them, thinking about how they want to scheme to try to get themselves ahead in this society. And St. Paul says to us as Christians, don't think about those things. Think about these other things. And as we think about these other things, we would recognize as well that even unbelievers have the capacity on the basis of the natural knowledge of God to make a distinction between that which is beautiful and that which is ugly. Between that which is commendable and that which is disgraceful. And so, as members of a civil society, we would see that we can, as it were, plant seeds of civil order and beauty and appreciation for art and music and all these other features of culture. Not that unbelievers are incapable of appreciating these things, but with the understanding that we as Christians who actually know the Creator and who have His scriptures as our guide are able to set the pace and lead others. What is it that has inspired most of the great works of art and music in the history of Western civilization? It's the Christian faith. I heard something very interesting recently that I didn't know before. Stephen Jay Gould, who passed away several years ago, was an avowed atheist and materialist, a well-known evolutionary scholar in Massachusetts. But he was also a member of a Bach musical society. And in his spare time, rehearsed, learned, and performed Bach music. And one time he was asked, if we were ever going to have an encounter with uh, intelligence from another planet, what's the first thing we should share with them in order to give them 
the best impression of what human beings are like. And Stephen Jay Gould said, we should play for them Bach's B minor mass because this is the best we have ever produced. An atheist said that. Now, if an atheist can recognize the significance of that music, what should be our view toward that music? Because we know the God who inspired it. We know the God who is confessed in the texts that that music accompanies. And so, we are not the only people who think about commendable, excellent, and praiseworthy things, at least externally, but we lead the way and in this way help to be a positive contributor to the building of human culture and in this way give glory to God. And let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Christians do have a unique love for each other. Christians do uniquely do good for each other. But yet, we are called upon here by St. Paul to do good to everyone as we have opportunity. This is another way in which we reflect in our relationships in the larger society what we believe about the originator of human society what we believe about the one who has created all human beings. It is a reflection of the love that God has put into us that we would love others. And that we would continue to love others and do good for others even when they hate us and do evil to us. That is something which the unbelieving world cannot understand. They can understand a situation where people love those who love them back. Jesus even talked about that. They don't understand a situation when people love those who hate them. But yet that is exactly what we are called upon to do, to be a light in a world of darkness, and to look for opportunities to do good for everyone. Everyone with whom we share this planet. Everyone with whom we share the struggles of civil and societal life on this planet. That's how we as Christians look at these things. Section C, human religiosity. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. I mentioned before that everybody has a natural knowledge of God. Everybody has this sense that there is a God, even in spite of the inner rebellion against God that also exists. But part and parcel with this natural knowledge of God comes an innate religiosity that is a universal feature of humanity. There is this sense that if there is a God who has created us, then this God is to be worshipped. We are to somehow figure out who he is and figure out the way to please him. Figure out the way to do what he wants because we know deep down someday we're going to have to give answer to him. This particular passage from St. Paul's epistle to the Romans is spoken with respect to Judaism as it existed in the first century. And this would apply likewise to Orthodox Judaism as it still exists in the world today. As St. Paul says, they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. One thing that definitely did happen to the people of Israel during the time of their 70 years of exile in Babylon is that they got the idolatry out of their systems once and for all. Before the time of the Babylonian captivity, before the time when the Assyrians took the northern kingdom away into captivity, both the northern and the southern kingdoms were continually plagued by idolatry, worshiping the gods of the Philistines, of the Canaanites, worshiping these idols, turning away from Yahweh, turning away from the one 
who had delivered them from slavery in Egypt and who had given them their own land. This was an endemic problem. But when the Jews emerged from Babylon, after 70 years of exile there, that was no longer a problem for Jews. They were absolutely, strictly monotheists, defining them to this day as believers in one God. That is admirable. But what is not admirable is the way in which rabbinic Judaism then taught regarding how people are to be right with this God and to be pleasing to him. It was through the law. And if the revealed laws weren't enough, the rabbis piled more and more laws on top of those with their traditions. That's the situation that Jesus found when he came to his people. That's the situation that Paul found. People who know that there's one God. They're absolutely sure of that. But they have no idea that the way to be right before this God is the way of faith in the gospel rather than the way of obedience. And so there's that form of religion that exists in the world today. But it's not the only form. Because Paul goes on, as quoted in the book of Acts, to address a pagan audience and to describe their religious instincts and practices. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of, of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods in the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. It's not just the Jews then, who do have a revelation from God, to, at least as their starting point, who are religious, but also these pagans are religious. Some of the brighter lights in their tradition some of the poets and philosophers have spoken of the one philosophical creator God who exists somewhere out there. But even people who practice a baser and more folksy kind of religion at least acknowledge that there is some kind of a supernatural force that they must reckon with. St. Paul, of course, in the beginning of his address to these men of Athens is, is finding common ground with these people. He's finding common ground in that they are religious. They know intuitively there, is a, there are gods or a god to be worshipped. And he explains to them that insofar as they have that sense, they are correct. However, when they divert this sense of worshipping away from the god who actually created them, and when they would think that they should be worshipping various idols that, that live in temples, he's explaining you're even going against the better tradition of your own natural knowledge of God. And so in the world today, there are more philosophically substantial religions. There are also religions that are very unsophisticated. We would deal with people and try to find common ground with them as we would seek to share with them the message of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit where they're at and would try to help them to tune in to the fact that what they are sensing intuitively is the beginning of a pathway which, through groping as it were, will lead them to the true God if that pathway is then enlightened by the proclaimed gospel of Christ. There are, as I mentioned before, many people today who claim to be atheists, who claim not to believe in any God at all. But I think they just don't understand what a God is. Your God is the thing that you find to be the ultimate organizing principle of your existence. 
and atheists do therefore all have a God. The question then is not whether or not they have a God, but who or what is their God? Everybody worships something. Everybody is fixed on something. Everybody is deeply attached to something. Everybody uses some kind of a criterion to make sense of their life and of the world in which they live. That is their God. People who might think that they don't believe in a God and they don't believe in the Ten Commandments or any of, any of these things can be reached evangelistically in the same way as St. Paul reached the people that he reached out to in Athens who knew nothing of the God of Israel, who knew nothing of the Hebrew scriptures, but who yet did have this sense that there is something out there. And so we too would recognize that insofar as people do have a sense of the divine, that's something we can work with. That's something that Paul worked with. That's something that missionaries today can work with. But of course, simply knowing that there is a God somewhere is not enough. I mentioned earlier that I lived for eight years in the former Soviet Union. There was a systematic brainwashing in the schools and other institutions of that society, uh, impressing on people over and over again that there is no God, that the only thing that exists is what you can see and touch and feel. When the Soviet Union collapsed, and when the people of the former Soviet republics emerged from that oppression and from that brainwashing. For many of them, they found it to be extremely liberating and a genuinely rehumanizing experience, once again to believe in the existence of God. When I was in the former Soviet Union, I would have to say that in my personal experience, I never met one person who identified himself or herself to me as an atheist. And in fact, many people were very joyful and and, and excited to be able to tell me and my colleagues that they believed in God, that they now believed in God. But as I would explain to my seminary students, the future pastors who would be preaching to these people, all that means is that they have now come up to zero. They've come up to the baseline of what is the normal human consciousness. Now it's time to proclaim to them who this God is, how this God has revealed himself, and how the Christian gospel introduces us to this God. An analogy that I used to use, which is apt in our situation too, is, um, is drawn from the common Soviet and post-Soviet lifestyle of living in apartment buildings. I lived in an apartment building. And you can tell from the footsteps that you hear above your ceiling that there's somebody upstairs in the apartment. You can hear the occasional noise they make. You can hear them occasionally slamming a door. You know they're up there. But that wall of floor and ceiling prevents you from really knowing anything about them until they come down the steps, knock on the door of your apartment, and introduce themselves to you as your neighbors. Then you know them. And that's the difference between those who have a natural knowledge of God and who are groping and trying to imagine what he's like based on hearing some bangs and footsteps upstairs and those who have been visited by Christ when Christ has knocked on the door and has introduced himself to us as the God who created us, who has redeemed us, and who now in the gospel wants to be a part of our lives. And so we would recognize that there is human religiosity that flows from the unique character of, of human life as compared to animal life. We would also recognize that it simply lays a foundation for being able to proclaim the Christian gospel to them. They are not yet really on their way to knowing Christ if that's all they have. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become 
corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. In spite of the religiosity, in spite of the curiosity about God and religion that is in everyone to one degree or another, there is also a deep lack of true faith in everybody by nature. According to the old nature, the old Adam would be willing to consider any kind of religion as possibly true, except for one, the Christian religion. According to the old nature, an unregenerated person will conceivably consider all different kinds of spirituality and all different kinds of belief systems. As long as the old nature itself can survive the experience. But the reason why unregenerated people in their state of unregeneration will never believe in the true God and will never believe in the true word of God is because the old nature cannot survive that religion. The God who actually exists and the God who actually saves people through his son Jesus Christ is a God who slays and makes alive. He is a God who drowns the old man and who gives us as our way of survival the regeneration and the new nature. So the old nature will never believe in the Christian message. There's nothing that you can do to, to spice it up or to ornament it or to make it seem attractive. If the essence of the Christian truth remains there, the old nature will always reject it because it is a death sentence to the old nature. And that's why the psalmist tells us that there are none who do good in this ultimate sense. There are none who seek after God in this ultimate sense. Oh yes, there's religious curiosity, there's religious observance, but there's no true belief in the true God and his true way of salvation apart from the regenerating work of God in Christ. Section D, the revealed knowledge of God and faith. Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. How does God tell us about himself? He speaks about himself. This is something that is really unique to our faith. The way in which God makes himself known is by his word, not by direct inner sensations or feelings or experiences, but by a message, a message that is proclaimed, a message that is filled with power, and a message that has its final culmination in Jesus Christ, who was not only a human prophet speaking the word of God, but who was God himself in human flesh, who spoke the decisive word from God to the human race, who spoke the decisive invitation to salvation to the human race. When he sent his, his apostles out, and when his apostles were the instruments through which the New Testament was written, this was a ripple of his impact when he became a part of human history. We don't need further revelation beyond Christ and the apostles who bore testimony to Christ and to the things that he did and said in his life on earth. Because God's word has now found its fulfillment. If you want to know what that person in the apartment upstairs is like, then listen to Jesus. He tells you what he's like. This is something that cuts through all of the human speculation and religious imagination in the world today. St. Paul also writes, from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. This is a very familiar passage to those of us who believe in the authority of scripture and who believe that it is a revelation from God to the human race. But notice some of the things in this passage that are important to notice. When he says, from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, 
The word he uses, translated as childhood, is actually the Greek word for infancy. In other words, for as long as Timothy has been alive, he has been acquainted with the sacred writings. Also, in these days, individual families did not have Bibles at home. Bibles were very hard to come by. Where people would have the scriptures would be in church or in earlier years, Timothy was no doubt brought to the synagogue by his Jewish mother and grandmother. And so his acquaintance with the sacred writings meant he was acquainted with the worshiping assemblies of God's people. But what it also meant is that the message of the scriptures was recounted and retold to him by his mother and grandmother at home. They didn't give him a Bible and say, go read this, but instead they told him about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They told him about the Exodus. They told him about the flood. They told him about all the things that Scripture reveals. So he grew up with this knowledge. But also, we are told in this passage that it, the Scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. To be wise for salvation means that you know the essence of it. We don't need to go beyond the scriptures in order to know what has been revealed regarding the way of salvation in Christ. And so we would reject the idea that more revelation is necessary. We would also, however, defend with as much strength as the Lord gives us the authority and the necessity of the scriptures that we do have. The devil knows that the best way to destroy the Christian faith is to destroy the authority of scripture. He knows that it works because he has seen it work every single time. And so we are simply reminded here that as Christians, we cannot ever let this authority go. And our whole lives must be permeated with it and with the message of it. Just as Timothy throughout his life was permeated by the content of the scriptures, which did make him wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. St. John then says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The scriptures do not simply reveal to us some interesting information about God. The scriptures do not simply satisfy religious curiosities, but instead the scriptures reveal the way of salvation to us. That's the way we cherish them. That's the way we use them. And that's the way we allow them to use us. We do not look to the scriptures as Christians the way other people might look to the horoscope in the newspaper. Instead, we recognize that God is speaking to us of our need for a savior, a savior whom he has given in the word of scripture. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Do you believe in the Trinity? I think probably if you profess to be a Christian, you do. But realize that believing in the Trinity is not simply one article of faith among many. The Trinity is a term that represents God, God's existence, and the way in which God connects himself to us and wraps himself around us and envelops us in himself. This passage from St. Paul's epistle to Titus is a good one which teaches the doctrine of the Trinity not as an abstract formulation, but by describing what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit do to regenerate us, to save us through word and sacrament, to give us new life, to draw us to himself, to make us capable of understanding what's in the scriptures, to give us a desire to serve him and to follow him. And so there's a description here of God our Savior, 
There's a description here of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Well, how many saviors do we have? Well, we have one, and so there's a, there's, this is the Father and the Son as two persons of the Godhead. And there's also a reference here to the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are described here not abstractly, but as God our Savior in every single sense. God the Father sent the Son, the Son sent the Spirit, and we are drawn up into a communion with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit through the regeneration that has worked in us and through the faith that flows from the new nature that is so regenerated. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Very little commentary is needed to make clear what Paul is saying here. The unbelieving world will never understand this. But when somebody becomes a believer, they get it. They understand what this is all about. They understand why we are the way we are. They understand why we love them even when they hate us. They understand why we are so desirous of living for this Savior and why we are willing, if need be, to die for him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We readily admit that we don't fully comprehend all of the things that we proclaim. We are able to understand as much about God as he has made known to us in the scriptures, but there's a whole lot that he has not made known. For many people, they have an excuse for unbelief that is based on the fact that the Bible doesn't answer all of their questions. What we would say is that that's true. The Bible doesn't answer all of my questions either, but it answers the questions that need to be answered. And it gives me a faith to be willing to wait until I'll have the answers to the other questions. But I would venture to say that when we are in the Lord's presence, when we could finally have the answers to those questions, we're not going to care anymore. Because all we really need to know is what God has made known to us. So we admit that we don't have all the answers. But that doesn't matter because we do have the answers that God has given us and these are the answers to humanity's deepest problems and deepest needs, which we'll now talk about in a minute. Section E, the incarnation, the gospel, and the church. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, 
having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. A couple of important points here. A description of the incarnation. In him, that is in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. The mystery of the incarnation means that there is no place where the humanity of Jesus is present, where the deity is also not present. Jesus is God and man in one person, always and everywhere. Every place where you have an encounter with Christ, you are having an encounter with the whole Christ. And when you know that Jesus is your divine command companion and your divine protector, he is also your human friend. Jesus is not only our divine companion and protector, but he is also our human companion and friend who can understand the human experience, who can understand our trials and our fears, but who also has the power as the Son of God to deliver us from our trials and fears. So this is a great comfort to us, one that we especially find meaningful in our sacramental life as Christians, knowing that through the Lord's word and institution, his actual human body and blood are present for us and are given to us in the Lord's Supper. Not only his divinity, but specifically his humanity. Jesus touches us in the Lord's Supper from the, his humanity to our humanity in a way that shows us and demonstrates to us that he truly is God who is deep in human flesh for our salvation and as such who is also a part of our lives as our savior and as the forgiver of our sins. This passage also speaks of baptism as another of the sacramental gifts of God through which God through the power of his word works in order to bring life where previously there was only death. The existence of those who do not know God is a deathly existence even with some human imagination and some human sensitivity to the existence of God, there is deep down a spiritual death. But when God's word and spirit comes to us in preaching or in the washing of baptism, God does a miracle and he gives life where there was previously only death. This also is another reason why an unbeliever is never gonna understand what you're talking about when you try to explain what it means to be a Christian. It's only when the Holy Spirit works through the gospel to make that person a Christian too that he will actually be able to begin to understand. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. There are two basic ways of figuring out truth in our, in our world, in our society. There's what we might call the scientific way and the judicial or legal way. The scientific method helps us to figure out the way things are, the way processes work, the way the world operates on an ongoing basis. However, a judicial or legal proof is not a proof of what is going on, but a proof of specific things that happened in history. When you are charged with a crime and you go to court, the prosecutor is going to try to prove through eyewitness testimony and other pertinent evidence that you committed a certain crime in a certain place at a certain time. That a specific act happened in history that was a crime for which you should be punished. Juries don't look through microscopes or through telescopes to figure out whether or not you committed a crime. They listen to legal evidence. They listen to eyewitness testimony. The existence of God can in some ways be discerned on the basis of the world of nature and the testimony that it gives to its creation. But the distinctive contours of the Christian religion 
are not discerned in that way. And so for anybody to say that the Christian faith is unscientific is simply mixing the wrong categories into this. We don't ask people to ponder the truthfulness of Christianity in terms of the scientific method. But rather, we invite them to ponder the truthfulness of Christianity in terms of whether or not there were reliable eyewitnesses who actually saw Jesus alive, who saw him dead, and who then saw him alive again. And St. Paul tells us that there were hundreds of people who saw this. Especially, of course, the 12 apostles. The ones who were chosen by Christ to be eyewitnesses of his entire ministry, to be those who heard all of his teaching, and who then were the ones who saw him risen and who were sent out especially to bring the gospel to all nations. All of these men were willing to die for the sake of proclaiming that Jesus was alive. Not just based on their sincerity in believing that some, a, a story that somebody else told them, but based on the fact that they actually saw him alive after they had also seen him dead. That is the nature of the message that we proclaim. The Christian faith is deeply rooted in history. We are not proclaiming a philosophical religion. We're proclaiming a religion that is about real things that happened to real people. Several years ago, my son, who was mentioned before as, as a pastor, when he was still a seminary student, had opportunity to take a trip to the Holy Land. And one of the attractions in Jerusalem is, of course, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was crucified and buried. Uh, it's all in this, on the same premises. And he recounted that during the daytime when his group went through that church, there was such a huge crowd of people that they were rushed through, and they really didn't have time at all to to really soak in what was inside that church. But he said he and another friend at night, when there were no more crowds, they went back on their own. And he said there was nobody there. And so he had an opportunity to go to the place where Jesus had been buried, the actual place, the place where he rose again, and to look at that place and to kneel in front of it and to be reminded of the fact this really happened. This is not somebody's idea. This is not somebody's theory. This is not somebody's proposal of what might be true. A man who was alive and who died rose again, thereby proving that everything he had said was true and thereby proving that his claim to have been God in the flesh is true. He is our savior, the one who justifies us and gives us eternal life. We believe this because it really happened. It's not just a theory. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The message that the church proclaims which delivers salvation to the world is the message of repentance and forgiveness of sins. This doesn't seem very exciting, does it? Forgiveness of sins, that's just the beginning, isn't it? Don't we go on to bigger and greater things? No, you never move beyond your need for the forgiveness of sins, and you never as a Christian move beyond the power and the love and the reconciliation with God in time and eternity that the forgiveness of sins continually gives you and renews to you. This is the message that we proclaim. This is the life of faith that we live. Not just because Martin Luther said that law and gospel are the fundamental doctrines of scripture, it's because Jesus said it. 
when he boiled down the apostolic proclamation to its most uh, seminal elements. He said, go out and proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins. You can almost imagine the apostle saying, that's it, that's all, that's it. Now, as we explain the whole counsel of God, we explain the whole counsel of God in a law gospel way. We show people how everything that God has revealed is not only true, but also how it applies to us in our life of faith in terms of our penitence for our sin, our failure to obey God, and our rejoicing in the gospel by faith as we know that our sins are forgiven and that life and salvation have therefore also been bestowed upon us. But that's the essence of it. If you ever go to a church where you never hear sermons about repentance and forgiveness of sins, then don't go to that church anymore because Jesus told the apostles to preach repentance and the forgiveness of sins. At the very least, you need to be hearing that once in a while in a church that claims to be apostolic. We're going to skip the next passage because I actually had decided to switch it to another topic, but I forgot to delete it from this topic. But we'll go on to the First Thessalonians 1. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. What happens when the Christian gospel in word and sacrament comes to individual people? It creates a new humanity. As we are called together into the fellowship of the church, we become a new world of love, and forgiveness and patience. What St. Paul is describing here is the internal life of a congregation. Now because we are all still sinners, because we still do have the old nature clinging to us, and we are not comprised only of the new nature, there will be weaknesses. There will be failures and flaws among us. And so that's why St. Paul says that sometimes we're going to have to admonish the idol he also says we will sometimes have to encourage the faint-hearted and help the weak because we often are distracted from our faith or discouraged and we need to be built up as our fellow brothers and sisters would encourage us with the gospel. He also says be patient with them all. We are patient with each other. We have to be in the fellowship of the church. I know my congregation has to be patient with me I'm quite sure you have to be patient with Pastor Thompson if you're a member of our church right here. But yet, as we are patient with one another, and as we are patient with our pastors, we are also given this instruction, that we are to respect those who labor among us and are over us in the Lord and who admonish us and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. The uniquely Christian understanding of spiritual leadership and and the teaching office and what we might call the office of spiritual fatherhood in the church is that this is an office that serves us by proclaiming and applying the word of God to us. We are governed and guided in the word of God by our pastors and we esteem them for this, we respect them for this. I don't say this only as a pastor but I say this as one who remembers the pastors in my life as I was growing up who in large measure built up in me the faith that I now have and prepared me for the pathway that I'm on as a pastor. And so we respect our pastors, not because of their charm and charisma, sometimes in spite of their lack of charm and charisma, but we respect them when they are faithful in taking care of us with God's word, not only preaching it to us in public gatherings, but also privately 
counseling us and praying with us and helping us through times of trial. This is a wonderful picture of the life of a Christian congregation as we recognize that there are flaws and little problems that will always have to be worked on, but yet as we recognize that God is among us, God is forgiving us, and God is giving us a forgiving heart toward others so that we can all be built up and united in love. And then there is this other verse that is a, the principle of reformation in the church. As, as a Lutheran, I believe in reformation, not just one event in the 1500s, but an ongoing process for God's people. St. Paul says, test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Section F, God's two realms. Now we're going to be departing away from a consideration of how Christians understand themselves as Christians to talking again how we interact as Christians in the larger world. Jesus said to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. This is a very general principle that, that Jesus has articulated that we continue to, to apply today as we would recognize the civil authorities under which we live and the duties that, we'd ha that we have toward the civil authorities. But while we would also recognize the duties and the responsibilities we have with respect to the kingdom of God and God's word. Um, but yet we make this distinction. And as Christians, we are not lawless. We are good citizens. We are people who try to obey the law, except on those, time, those occasions when the law is inherently sinful. We'll get to that in a minute. But as we would then recognize this principle, St. Paul fleshes it out in more detail in Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to all. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed honor to whom honor is owed. What we see here is that when we are rendering our proper service to Caesar, we are actually in another way rendering that service to God as well. Not only as we would serve God in his direct kingdom, but also when we serve God in his indirect kingdom, we are serving God. Because the governing authorities are appointed by God. This passage not only teaches us how we as citizens should think of our authorities, it also is an instruction to the authorities, reminding them of what God would say is their duty. Their duty is to punish evildoers and to protect law-abiding people. Notice also that the civil authorities are given the authorization to use deadly force. He does not bear the sword in vain as St. Paul says, in the church, we never use deadly force. We never use coercion. We never use any authority except the authority of God's word to do our work as members of God's kingdom. But yet, as members of the civil realm, we would sometimes be in a situation where we would use force. If we are police officers, if we are in the military, or if we, in some other capacity, are serving the government and serving its legitimate purposes of protecting law-abiding people, sometimes with the use of deadly force against those who are threatening them. Notice also that the reason why we submit to the authorities and honor them is not just because we would be punished if we don't do so, but for the sake of conscience. 
because we know that God wants us to be this way, to be respectful of those who have been placed over us and to recognize that they are his servants. And that means we will pray for the mayor, the governor, the president. We will seek to do our civil duty, whatever that might be. We will have respect for those who serve us in civil offices. Certainly in a democracy, we have a unique privilege of being able to determine who will in fact be serving us in such positions. And so we especially should be using that voting responsibility uh, wisely and in accordance with God's will as we understand it. But we would certainly understand as well that whoever is in authority, if they are in authority legitimately, are there because God has put them there, has given them a task, and we should do as much as we can to encourage them and to support them in that task. But there is an exception to all of this, which I alluded to earlier, given to us in Acts 5. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council. And the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. When the civil authorities command you to do something which God forbids, or when the civil authorities forbid you to do something which God commands, then you may not obey the civil authorities. You must obey God and let the ships fall where they may. Because our conscience before God is paramount, not our concern about whether we might suffer hardship or punishment in the civil realm. For people who live under oppressive governments, governments that persecute the church, governments that try to harm the church, this is often a great cross for them to bear. But yet we are told that when we confess Christ before men, he will confess us and acknowledge us before his Father in heaven. And so we do have this eternal hope, knowing that if with the Lord's help we are faithful to him in this world, he will be faithful to us in the next world. Once again, living in a former Soviet Republic for eight years, I became acquainted with horrendous things that were done by the Bolsheviks in the persecution and murder of Christians. But I also heard many ennobling and inspiring stories about people who were willing to die for the sake of Christ, who did not forsake him, who did not deny their faith, and who therefore died with a clear conscience. The communists used to say to the free world, but they included Christians too, we will bury you. In other words, we're going to outlast you. And so all these sacrifices and all these noble confessions of faith that you make and your willingness to die for what you believe, it's all for nothing because we're going to wipe you out. Nobody's going to believe what you believe anymore in the future. Everybody's going to be a communist. Well, remember, I'm an American Lutheran minister who was in a former Soviet republic. That's not the way it worked out. And so when people are faithful, even in the face of great persecution and, and, and many threats, God will be faithful to us. He will strengthen us in those times and he will bless the confession of faith that we make, even if we have to make it to the point of death. But when God has told us his truth, when he has told us to believe it, when he has told us to preach it, and when he has told us to act on it, that is paramount. And that is what governs us more than anything else. G, vocation. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. I'm using this verse as just a basic introduction to the general concept of Christian vocation. We have the Ten Commandments, which are an unvarying moral code that apply to all people. In our small catechism, the Ten Commandments is in a very prominent place, reminding us of what the standards of right and wrong are. But we also have the table of duties in the small catechism. 
in the back of the catechism where some people often don't even look. And if you look at the section of uh, the small catechism that deals with uh, confession and absolution, you'll see that Dr. Luther advises us as we are thinking about the things we should confess. He says, evaluate your calling in life on the basis of the Ten Commandments. And so when we think about what God expects of us, and when we think about what our duty is toward him and other people, we don't think only in terms of the Ten Commandments, we also think in terms of vocation. What standing, uh, what's, what, 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 situ, sta um, what station in life do we have? What has God called us to? Who has he called us to serve? Um, each of us has specific callings. Those callings may change at different points in our life, but we, the callings that we have are the callings we are expected to follow in service to our neighbor as we would uh, honor God by doing the things that we're supposed to do. It's quite often uh, the case when you have a very eager and, um, and excited and enthusiastic seminary student. You'd ask him, you know, what is God calling you to? And he would say, God's calling me to be a pastor. And what would a Lutheran say? No. Right now, God is calling you to be a seminary student. If it is his will, in the future, he may call you to be a pastor. But pay attention to what your calling is now and ask the Lord to help you to fulfill your calling now. If he gives you another calling in the future, that'll be great. But for now, he has called you to certain things. And so, what is your calling now? Well, many of you are in school. You have a calling to be a student. If you're married, you have a calling to be a faithful husband or wife. If you have children, you have a calling to be a devoted and attentive parent. You have a calling to be a, uh, a responsible resident of your city, a responsible citizen of your country. You have a calling to fulfill the duties at your place of employment faithfully, if you have a job. You have a full array of callings, things that contribute toward the well-being of the world and things that God wants you to be doing so that you can be a part of his solution rather than a part of the problem. This doctrine of vocation is somewhat unique to the Lutheran Church because in the crucible of the Reformation, uh, the reformers of our church understood that you don't serve God best by forsaking earthly callings and joining a monastery or a convent, but you serve God best in the world by fulfilling the callings that he has established for you and that he has placed you in. And so it's not as if Lutherans didn't believe in following God's call, but they didn't follow God's call to convents and monasteries. They followed God's call into marriage, into parenthood, into productive jobs, into responsible citizenship. I spoke of marriage. That, of course, is a fundamental building block of a human civilization. The marriage of a man and a woman who provide a stable environment within which children are conceived and raised. This is one of the bedrock foundations that the Lord has given to the human family. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. What God has joined together, let not man separate. God uses means. What are the means that God uses to unite a man and a woman in marriage? Well, he uses them. He uses their desire to marry each other. But guess what? When you are exchanging those vows, God is joining you together through your vows. You are not joining yourself together in the ultimate sense. And therefore, God, from that moment forward, is in charge of your marriage. And the things that he makes you responsible for within marriage are things that he expects you to fulfill. Always calling upon him for help, always calling upon him for instruction. 
Notice also that when people were uh, asking Jesus about divorce, he said, let not man separate. He's not talking about some outside person. He's talking about you within your marriage thinking you want to end it. He says, no, God joined you together and therefore your marriage belongs to him. It doesn't belong to you. And so you may not break up your own marriage. When I was a vicar, I had the opportunity to um, get acquainted with a, a couple in the congregation that lived in a, in a nursing home. They were quite elderly, uh, in their 90s, and uh, the, the woman of the couple was a little bit more um, sort of out of touch mentally uh, compared to the man, but the man was very sharp. And uh, his wife was in a wheelchair and he doted on her and took care of her and uh, loved her and just was, it was such a wonderful example of, uh, of what Christian marriage means when people have been married that long. And I can remember for several months prior to this, um, they were coming up on their 75th wedding anniversary. He was looking forward to this for months. And, and I said, um, you know, that's great. I, you know, I'd like to be there for that. And so they invited me. So when they, when they had their 75th wedding anniversary party at this nursing home, they had all of their children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, there might have been a few great-great-grandchildren, and then my wife and me. And the Lord was so good to that couple on that occasion because um, his wife was more lucid and alert and interactive on that day than I, I'd ever seen her before in the preceding year. This was such a wonderful example to me of what a marriage can be and what a stable and loving marriage can do for generations upon generations of the descendants of such a family. It is such a, a sad thing when young people come to a few bumps in the road of their marriage and the first thing they want to do is go to divorce court. Um, they will deprive themselves and their descendants of the joy that I witnessed on that occasion. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Slaves or servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ, not by the way of eye service as people pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening, knowing that he who is both their master and yours uh, is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Here, St. Paul goes down a list of callings and the interlocking relationships that people have according to their callings. And he gives us some specific Christian encouragement for how most fruitfully and beneficially to live out those callings. Even people who don't know the Lord, on the basis of, again, the natural knowledge of God, can in many ways figure these things out. They can figure out and in large measure can reflect within their families love and faithfulness between husband and wife, devotion to children, and the children can learn how to show respect for their parents. And so we would recognize that these things are possible in the larger human family and we would encourage these things in the larger human family, not only among Christians, but yet as Christians we do have the advantage of the very specific instruction that St. Paul and the other apostles would give us for how we, in a specifically Christian way, can appreciate and understand the responsibilities that we have within these relationships. That is, my friends, the conclusion of my presentation. I think that what we have reviewed together, although in many ways only touching the surface, is an understanding of the comprehensive way in which Christians look at the world 
in which Christians look at the whole human race and the whole human experience and also the way Christians look at themselves as they live in this world and also as they, as Christians, cultivate the unique life of faith that God has given us through Christ. We are members of the church. The people with whom we have spiritual fellowship in the church are our brothers and sisters. And there is a new humanity that has been birthed in the fellowship of the church by the Spirit of God. But we are also still members of the larger human family. We have responsibilities. There are things that we can encourage the members of our society in general to see and to understand. And there are things that we can be a part of in order to bring glory to God and honor to God's name in all of the many relationships that we have with others in this world. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. I want to thank you for your presentation, Pastor. Um, well, I guess afterwards we will um, allow any questions. If you have any questions, um, please try to keep them somewhat brief. Um, thank you. Thank you. Made me think quite a bit. I think my favorite part is uh, thinking about God upstairs. And if you don't know who he is, well, here's how you learn. Um, does anybody have any questions? Um, Curtis will be holding the microphone back there. So if anybody has questions, you can line up in the back if you want to ask anything. Um, and that way it also or will be... Or a comment or a criticism. There you go. Do you want to, anybody? Okay. There you go. So, I, that was a wonderful message. And I think everybody in this room really appreciates that message and understands that message. In our society today, where... I, I don't know how long you spoke, um, where a minute is kind of what you get to get your message across. How do we, as, as Christians, that would like to shed that light, do that in a, in a society that wants to give you a minute, and then they're going to tell you all the reasons why Christians are judging everybody? Well, it's hard to answer that question because I would say that, I guess, humanly speaking, it's impossible. We are able to share the faith with other people usually within the context of a relationship with other people. And so we need to have more than a minute. It needs to be people who know us and, they've, and who have gotten to know um, our character, our values, our convictions and who have come to learn, perhaps experientially, that we don't hate them, we love them. And that then creates a context where we can say something. Now, public preachers and teachers, of course, can preach sermons, and you have St. Paul preaching a, a message in Athens, and uh, he had more than a minute. You know, he went on and gave a whole presentation, and, uh, and so people who have that kind of opportunity... Mm -hmm.